Good evening, everybody. Really fantastic to welcome you all here. Uh, love to do to actually have in-person uh, meetings. We have got also uh, 148 people online, so this is a great hybrid event, great way to, to uh, share this, the knowledge and experience of what we've been doing over the last seven months now. Um, we've, got a, we've got about an hour and a half this evening of uh, speakers, and I'm, everybody's seen, I think, the advertised list, so I will introduce everybody. I think we'll introduce each other each as we go along. Um, but we are going to talk about the Rwanda High Court judgment and the implications and next steps. Very timely, of course, because of course the final judgment handdown was actually only on Monday, although we have had the actual judgment uh, in more or less final form since the 19th of December. I'm not sure that's made it any better, but we have had it since then. Um, so unusually the court handed down the judgment but said that they would adjourn all consequential matters until monday so we had four weeks or so to pour over that with our christmas dinners and so on but we have each party managed to formulate uh, grounds and that was what was considered um, on monday but just before i go through what the grounds are and what we think of the matters going to be going forwards i just thought i'd put up a summary of the judgment um, it actually comes from the way the court summarised the judgment, so uh, it won't necessarily come as any surprise to you because the court published their 150 pages or whatever judgment we have, plus they also published a short summary themselves, and then they've also given a summary of what happened on Monday. So in short, sorry, people are coming in, but do feel free to sit down whilst we start. Um, in short, and in no surprise to anyone sitting in this room, the court concluded it was lawful for the government to make the arrangements for, re for relocating asylum seekers to Rwanda and for their asylum claims to be determined in Rwanda rather than in the UK. Uh, importantly, which is why I've emphasised it there, on the evidence before the court, so the court did draw a line in the sand saying what evidence was admissible and what they considered and what they excluded, which is actually relevant to one of our cases. Um, but on the evidence before the court, the government had made arrangements with, with uh, the government of Rwanda and they intended to ensure that those asylum claims were relocated, if persons relocated to Rwanda are going to be properly determined there. And that was their conclusion. <clears throat> they said it was consistent with the Refugee Convention and the statutory and legal obligations under the Human Rights Act. All of which may come as a bit of a surprise to all of you, but that is the conclusion of the court. So you will remember. <laughs> Okay, you'll remember, of course, that the um, case was brought by three NGOs. So this is a problem online with feedback. If I can hear a bit of feedback, um, just all bear with you. Would be because I'm moving. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think it's um, you'll remember that the, the case was brought by three two NGOs, um, Detention Action and Care for Calais, and the PCFU Union as well. And then Asylum Aid had a separate uh, challenge that was brought, um, heard and brought after the conclusion of the main claims. There were also a number of individual litigants, all of whom were really known as AAA and others in the first claim. And so it's important when we look at the judgment to look at what was being decided on whose behalf. So the court having concluded that the uh, in principle, the policy of the Rwanda MEDP <coughs> was lawful, then actually considered whether the Secretary of State had properly considered the circumstances of the individual claimants um, and it emphasized it was important that those needed to be properly decided. <laughs> finally concluded that in eight individual claimants, their, uh, their decisions to refuse their human rights claims, and in seven out of eight, I think it is, uh, in, in the, to, to set aside their inadmissibility decisions. It, the other critical thing, which will affect, again, litigation strategies for all people in this room, and thinking about how we're we going to work going forwards, was that they, the court concluded that the NGOs, the two NGOs, that is, Detention Action and <coughs> Care for Calais, and the PCSU didn't have standing to bring claims where individuals were better placed to do so. They didn't make that same finding in respect of asylum aid, as you'll see. So on Monday, all of the parties, that is 
the AAA individual and the NGOs for the permanent standing and the individual claimants who were left in, um, which is the AAA individuals plus RM, AS, uh, ASM and AS, sought some, uh, permission to appeal. Um, and in summary terms, and again, this is what's how the courts have published it in their judgment, quite important to read the, the permission judgment as well. The principal point to observe, this is the, these are the grounds on which they granted permission to appeal so far. Importantly, they didn't concede that there was anything wrong with their judgment. They said that it came under 52.6 of the CPR, other compelling reasons. So they didn't say there was a realistic prospect of success, but did recognize that there was an interest in those cases, in those grant, these grants being pursued. And in summary terms, you can see the question of Article 31 of the Refugee Convention, the consist, uh, whether it's uh, consistent with Section 2 of the 93 Act, the question of retained EU law, just, just go through in more detail in the next slide, and um, the, the requirements of 345B uh, of the immigration rules, and whether the power under section, um, under uh, paragraph 17 uh, of schedule part five to the 2004 Act was properly used. And then second main ground was whether the conclusion uh, of whether the Rwanda was a safe third country whether it was consistent with the requirements of our, under Article 3, and also whether the arrangements for taking decisions were systemically unfair. And this is the asylum aid ground, um, the final ground, particularly although it is also being pursued by AAA, was are the decisions, the process for taking decisions systemically unfair because they don't permit asylum claimants um, to, to make up an opportunity to consider the Secretary of State's reasons for concluding that Rwanda is safe and then make representations in response. So it's a process point, but a critically important one, particularly in the context of an arrangement like this, which was new based on evidence we didn't have or hadn't seen in full, which some of which was subject to a PII um, certificate um, by, that the government imposed, some of which we successfully set aside. So that's a summary of the grounds. So we can email these slides out to hopefully after the, after the seminar. But just um, to just to break them down a little bit more for, for your benefit, the application of the Othman test, the assurances contained in the memorandum of understanding and the notes of a bow provide sufficient guarantee to protect against the risk of removal from Rwanda and other article mm -hmm. treatment. Um, the back to the Article 31 penalty point, the certification power under part five of Schedule Three. What, really, what in fact the question was whether the assessment document. The admissibility uh, uh, guidance and the uh, based on the safe created a presumption of safety in Rwanda and was that compatible with the statutory scheme that was set out in the 2000s? <laughs> All these are going to be uh, articulated in more depth by my colleagues, but I just wanted to set out what was uh, what the court what grounds were put to the court whether the scheme again was consistent with the Refugee Convention, systemic unfairness, retained EU law, but. To, to, to pull those out in a little bit more detail. Some of the grounds were refused. So at least I think it's four of the generic uh, AAA grounds and two of our grounds. And um, I think other, one or two other grounds in the other individual cases. So those are possible renewals of the Court of Appeal. As far as I understand, most claimants are, or appellants are going to renew. The deadline is the 30th of January. It's not anticipated necessarily that there'll be another court, there'll be an oral hearing in the Court of Appeal. My this, the current thinking, go, although of course it's not up to us, is that this will be dealt with on the papers initially by the Court of Appeal because there is going to be a hearing now. So the question of the breadth of that hearing is really what the court will decide. But those um, are the sort of the, the, the key grounds. Importantly, and ground one, which is the which is AAA ground, and also the ground that was pursued by AS, uh, who who was uh, was part of the team representing AS. The question about the Ilias test, that's the procedural obligations under Article Three, of uh, the Strasbourg case, when determining whether the Secretary of State had conducted a su sufficiently thorough examination of the adequacy of the Rwandan scheme. That's really the, what we thought of being the core ground. That's one where the court did not declined to grant a permission, um, which is surprising. Similarly, on the tame side argument, in terms of duty of inquiry on the part of the Secretary of State before making uh, such certification decisions, 
to exclude um, asylum claims on the basis that they're inadmissible. The interpretation and application of the serving test, the risk of reform, um, and whether uh, asylum seekers in Rwanda would be accorded their rights under the Refugee Convention. Um, standing, which of course they've refused, well, they, of course, is an important ground. They've refused permission on that. I'm confident that will be re re renewed. Whether the removals poli policy is Gillick unlawful, and whether in the individual case of AS, who is the only one, I think, or they're one of two who didn't have their individual decisions quashed uh, on inadmissibility. So though that's the lie of the land as we now know, and we have we ought to have this uh, seminar today rather than waiting until the decision from the Court of Appeal. We don't quite know when that will be, and we don't quite know when the case will be listed, although we anticipate something like April, May, May more likely perhaps for the, for the substantive. So that's where we are now. And the next uh, speaker, Mark Symes probably needs no introduction to you, is going to talk about how that inadmissibility regime looks now post AAA, and then my learned colleagues will take you through the next step. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the um, issue of um, the inadmissibility regime itself. And you know, this arises in a particular context. You know, we've, we've had the luxury of um, European Union law being part of the common European asylum system for the last decade and a half. And that gentle, calm environment has made us forget like, what a rough sea public international law is for refugees generally. You know, the Refugee Convention, when it was passed, not well, when it was agreed in the 1950s, but a massive derogation from the previous understanding of what states could do to non-nationals. And you know, the general understanding that you see trotted out time and time again by the Strasbourg court as well as domestic courts is that states are sovereign over their borders. You know, that, that's the ultimate rule of public international law. And yet the Refugee Convention is an enormous incursion on that. Um, you know, most of the countries of the world are signed up to the Refugee Convention and it delimits where you can send people. It says you can send people not to a place where their life or freedom would be threatened. And it doesn't say too much else about where you can send them. And in a way, this random litigation is partly about uh, revisiting uh, those um, fairly ancient ideas about, about state sovereignty and uh, you know, what the Refugee Convention, how the Refugee Convention limits it. And one thing to point out is that, of course, there were two regimes in play for um, safe third country in terms of what one, one presently encounters two regimes. There's the pre 28th June 22 regime. And there's the post 28th June 22 regime for convenience, the modern regime. Obviously, the Rwandan litigation was brought against the old regime. Yeah. So when you're reading it, when you're reading the judgment and so forth, and then doing casework, it's important for it not to be tempted by templates. And you know, we should remember that um, you know, it's a new statutory scheme yeah, with different wording, replacement of exceptionality <laughs> by reasonableness, and so on and so forth. So it's a different, different regime now. And although I'm not sure that the ultimate architecture is any different, um, you know, obviously the, it does look different. So anyway, under the regime that the AAA court is looking at, uh, there are two key elements, safe third country and candidates for inadmissibility. Safe third country is somewhere where life and liberty is not threatened for a convention reason, somewhere that respects the right to non-refoulement, somewhere that prohibits onward removal contrary to the ECHR, contrary to the core obligations under the ECHR, i.e. To, not, not to torture or inhumanly degrade people, uh, and also a place where refugee status can be requested and protection awarded to the standards of the Refugee Convention. It doesn't expressly say you have to be a convention signatory, but it says you have to get convention equivalent status. And, and each of these headlines, you know, was the subject of discussion in the random case. So, you know, life and liberty not threatened for refugee convention reason, there's an argument there, because Rwanda has been guilty of um, uh, some mishaps over time with its treatment of refugees. You know, Rwanda is a major uh, destination for refugees, like whether they like it or not. Um, but and, and Rwanda hadn't always perfectly respected their rights. There's stories of refoulement, there's uh, documented, confirmed, documented accounts of forced conscription and, um, you know, and, and of severe repression against anyone who complains about their situation. Non-refoulement, as I've already mentioned, 
Um, you know, again, that could be live with Rwanda. Historically, UNHCR say that Rwanda has refooled people, i.e. at the airports. It's not let people get into the asylum process. Same coin, the same facts apply really for the um, Article 3 onwards removal point. And then the possibility of requesting refugee status and receiving protection under the Refugee Convention. Well, again, that, that, that raises the question of um, how good are the asylum detection techniques in Rwanda? How good a status determination system do they have in play? Okay, so that's a safe third country definition. And you know, that's, that, that obviously, unsurprisingly, um, the, the, the claimants in the Rwanda litigation are attacking the conclusions about whether or not Rwanda meets, you know, fits the bill under those headlines. Um, inadmissibility. So inadmissibility is if you've either been recognised as a refugee somewhere you can return to, or you enjoy sufficient protection somewhere, including non refoulement so that might be right to residence, but not as a refugee, somewhere where you could enjoy sufficient protection, including non Um because you've already made a protection application there, that's like someone who claimed asylum in France and departed before it was determined, would have made a protection application but failed to do so and can't show exceptional circumstances, or there's a connection to that country and it's reasonable to expect you to go there. So that would appear to be you know, asylum seekers who've got some strong family connection or strong ancestral connections with somewhere that's not the UK and not their country of origin. So that's the uh, regime in terms of the candidates for inadmissibility. And the consequence of inadmissibility are firstly, Home Office will try and send you somewhere, um, either where you were previously present or where you have a connection or to any other safe third country. So that's where Rwanda comes in, yeah? Rwanda obviously comes under the third of those names. So traditionally, obviously in, for many years now, um, you know, we've had the Dublin litigation in respect of many EU countries. And the basic idea under the Dublin litigation obviously was that someone would uh, have a, would be fingerprinted in France or Germany and they'd face return there. And as a result of that, um, there was no distinction between the country of return and the country that, you know, the country in which they've been detected. You're being sent back to the country with which there's been some link established. Obviously, Rwanda is a bit like a bit different to that, because with Rwanda, the trigger is not is not claiming asylum in Germany or abandoning your asylum claim in Greece. But the result of the trigger is being sent somewhere you've never been before. Obviously, that could be objectionable. Um, one might say, I suppose, that there's no reason in principle why sending you somewhere you've never been is worse than sending you somewhere you have been, given that many places where asylum seekers pass through have been shown inadequate. There's the Strasbourg court finding that uh, Greece is utterly unsafe for asylum seekers for 15 years. Witness the Strasbourg court and everyone else finding that Hungary is unsafe. So you might say that it'd be better to send refugees to Canada you know, than it would be to send them to um, Hungary or, or Greece. You might say that. But, you know. Anyway, another consequence is that there's no right of appeal in country and no prospect of entering the UK asylum system if you're inadmissible. And then 345D, if a removal to a third country then a reasonable period of time is unlikely, or if the Home Office determines it inappropriate, the claim had to be admitted for consideration. I do notice that um, some of them have how they drafted it. Many, many people obviously are in limbo while the Home Office fiddle around, hoping to find a destination for them. Um, whilst it's that the Home Office is responsible for the question, is it appropriate to send you to a third country? Maybe not to send you to relax the procedure because of UK ties or mental health issues or whatever. Um, the question of reasonable period of time is not linked to the Home Office opinion. And I'm not sure if that point's been really taken yet because Rwanda is obviously taking, is challenging acting under these provisions, not failing to act. But you know, there may be an interesting point there. Anyway, that's the um, that's most of the current regime. And then, then there's some statutory stuff in the back, in, in the back end of the 2004 Act. Uh, about presumptions and rights of appeal. Basically, the idea is that um, there's a series of presumptions of differing strengths about what can be contested and what can't under the 2004 Act. Of course, one important feature of the 2004 Act, i.e. the old style random cases, most of the current cohort, is that they, if they made a human rights claim and the Home Office certified it as clearly unfounded, they had an out-of-country right of appeal. Modern cases, of course, don't. No right of appeal whatsoever. Now, 
good news or bad news. Obviously not brilliant, not having an out-of-country appeal, but on the other hand, it would appear to make the court the primary decision maker. We've never had that. We've been protected from that for the last 20 years. We're clearly unbounded, whereby the legal tests have all been about um, is it when to be unreasonable? Is there another public law flaw in the Home Office approach to someone's human rights case? But all that's predicated on the fact that there is an out-of-country right of appeal. Take away the out-of-country right of appeal and the court will be the um, first port of call for determining not just legality, but merits, I think. Okay, modern regime. Modern regime, not very different, but is in the statute. Yeah, Section 80B of the 2002 Act as amended. So, you know, although this flows from the 22 Act, it's not freestanding provisions. It's, stand, it's provisions inserted into the, 20, the 2002 Act. And you know, so this is the same idea. Yeah, inadmissibility um, blocks you from entering the UK asylum system, but of course, no out of country right of appeal if your human rights claim is certified as clearly unfounded. Same third country are pretty well the same tests as we've seen under the domestic regime, but you know a different home. And now there's in Section 80B4 statute. Um, connection tests, well, similar connection tests as we've seen under the immigration rules. But notice that the test is reason when it comes to why did you fail to claim asylum in France, Germany, Greece? The test has become: would it reasonable to expect a claim to be made? Reasonable to expect whereas previously it was, were there exceptional circumstances? So they've toned down, if anything, it's an easier test, you might think, to satisfy. What was the home of a scheme for Rwanda? The, the basic idea is that you're packed off there if you made a dangerous journey in 2022, unable or likely to cause harm or injury. Some of the refusal letters seem to add a different test. And this, this is something the court didn't really engage with in um, AAA. Um, which is that many, well, some refusal letters, our refusal letter, AS's refusal letter, quite clearly said that he'd been assessed for Rwanda by reference to the adults at risk policy. But that, of course, was not, that's not what the inadmissibility policy says. Um, and it would appear to insert a different criteria, which would obviously be, you know, a, a public law feeding frenzy in terms of the breach of fairness that, that would entail. Okay, on from the theory into the practice, then what do they say in AAA? Um, two cases, we hear a lot of these cases this year, yeah? Ilias and Othman. Ilias is the Strasbourg court's approach to safe third country. Othman is the Strasbourg court's approach to measuring assurances and their reliability. Ilias says there has to be a thorough examination, um, an up-to-date assessment in the accessibility and functioning of the receiving country's asylum system and its safeguards. And then there'll be a debate, a debate that will rage for much of this year, no doubt, about who conducts that. What do the domestic courts do? Do they make up their own mind or do they review what the Home Office has done? Who knows? Uh, it, it's not, the, the, the AAA court didn't really descend into that. Uh, perhaps the Court of Appeal will. Anyway, the Home Office case, yeah, it was very much that they'd got these uh, note verbal and a memorandum of understanding in which Rwanda promised to behave itself vis-a-vis -vis asylum seekers, not only to behave itself, but to, you know, bestow upon them a panoply, a panoply of, 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 of um, tweets, you know, that would make anyone want to go to Rwanda, um, including a complaints process, you know, I mean, everything you've ever wanted in the asylum system is in the memo of understanding. UNHR disagreed with uh, Rwanda as a, you know, zone of perfection for asylum seekers and they said there's discrimination against the lgbti community very inexpert decision makers a, a joke of a process uh, no representation in first instance hearings no case had ever gone to the high court they said there were protection gaps in the legislation and that there was a big lack of capacity capacity you know, the court says that the memorandum of understanding is enough yeah you can the promises around us promises fill all those gaps a bit improbable that might seem that's the court's answer um, it says that we've got good diplomatic relations with Rwanda and Rwanda had been bribed sorry not bribed had an incentive <laughs> to uh, we were giving them so much money that they wouldn't possibly misbehave um, UNHR yeah UNHR you know over went, went in a bit too hard in the tackle at one point and in their submissions they said a lot of stuff that was not really consistent with what they'd said publicly previously and that diminished the force of their interventions. The court says, controversially, that the Home Office didn't have to look at the israel Rwanda agreement. Uh, it wasn't a relevant point of comparison, or at least it was not unlawful to leave it out of account. No reasoning for that. Remarkable thing to do. 
you do wonder, the more I look at it, the more you, I wonder if that's a deliberate invitation to the higher courts, you know, to like intervene if they feel like it. We recall that E.M. Eritrea Trea Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Sedley and his friends wrote a judgment that ran contrary to 40 years of thinking on the Strasbourg Convention. And obviously they were going to be overturned in the Supreme Court. And that was their intention. You do wonder if Swift and Lewis, who obviously are far cry from Sedley and his compatriots uh, in, in the old court of appeal. You do wonder, though, if there's the same thing going on there. Um, anyway, so no, no reason to think that Randy would harm complainants and that um, you know, the complaints procedure would, would look after any problems they had. So I, I'm not dealing with the human rights right points. My colleagues are dealing with the human rights points. But just in terms of the inadmissibility points, because there's a lot here, yeah, a lot here. Because you might have thought that really, if you travelled across a few European Union countries, you might have thought it would be quite easy for a decision maker to say that you should have owned asylum. But every inadmissibility certificate got overturned except AS. And AS, the only reason he didn't get overturned was because he had been granted asylum. So, you know, the best will in the world, he wasn't going to get off the ground in terms of showing inadmissibility against the asylum certificate based on his own conduct. Other people, though, it was a fact, I mean, a remarkable um, you know, cutting and pasting in home office refusal letters, which muddled up people's facts. So that's what you have to there, Gemma. Um, complaints about the police in the needed to be taken into account. If someone said they'd been locked up in a lorry, uh, you had to decide whether or not they'd had a reasonable chance to claim asylum. Um, you had to assess the control over them by people smugglers. Um, and also you'd have to assess whether or not the people smuggling crossed the Rubicon into trafficking. So you know, re really rather a lot of material there uh, in terms of overturning certificates before you even get to, is my asylum claim suitable for Rwanda? And what are my Article 3, Article 8 points? Um, I'm about to finish. I want to make one point on the, well, I think one of the cases, one, one loses track, but one of the grand appeal that hasn't got permission, the point that Richard Drabble is taking on um, e EU law and whether or not the government forgot to repeal common European asylum system in English law. Um, obviously, that'd be a remarkable, if he's right, that'd be a remarkable thing, a remarkable thing to show. But if that, if that did succeed in the Court of Appeal, it wouldn't just take down the third country regime, it would take down almost the whole of the 22 Act on asylum. It would take down the standard of proof, because that would be inconsistent with the basic provisions of the Qualification Directive as historically interpreted by the British courts. It would take down the uh, differentiation regime, which would be straight up incompatible with the Refugee Convention, and it would take down the reduction of the threshold in criminality for defining particularly serious crime. So if he's right, it would be a, you know, a Copernican revolution in um, mm -hmm. you know, how asylum is dealt with in the UK. Okay, thank you very much. I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Isaac Rigger Richardson, who's part of the team in AS. Thank you. And he's going to speak on the clearly unfounded certificates. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. As Sonali said, I was on AS's team as well, and I'm going to talk to you today about clearly unfounded certificates, which are likely to be a key element in preventing removal going forward, uh, not least because, as Mark vividly described, uh, the challenges to inadmissibility certificates are likely to be increasingly difficult. So I'm going to address you uh, on the four points that are set out in this context page. First is, is the purpose of the human rights claim. Second is the test for challenging certification of human rights claims as clearly unfounded. Third, the impact of the AAA judgment on challenges to clearly unfounded certificates. And fourth, uh, key things to focus on to set up your challenge. So the first slide is called the purpose of the human rights claim. And what I mean by that really is why you want to make one in order to challenge removal. So as Mark has already explained in great detail, the outcome of the AAA case really is that it's going to be increasingly difficult to challenge inadmissibility decisions uh, based on generic material about risks in Rwanda. And what that means is that it's increasingly important as a result to make a, a human rights claim and indeed a strong human rights claim with as much evidence as possible. That's not only because, at least in theory, you get an in-country right of appeal if you make a human rights claim, but also because it's the best way of putting forward uh, the facts of your case and why, notwithstanding the generic material, there is a risk to the human rights of your, your client. So I'd say that in theory, you get an in-country right of appeal. And the reason that I say that is that 
in almost all cases in the Rwandan context, the Home Office is likely to certify the claim as clearly unfounded. That's problematic, as Mark says, not only because you lose the in-country right of appeal, but because post 28th of June 2022, you lose any right of appeal whatsoever. So the central question becomes how you challenge a clearly unfounded certificate in order to regain that appeal right and have an opportunity of challenging removal. So the first question really is what the test for challenging a clearly unfounded certificate is. And the thing to remember here, which is summarized by the case law on the slide, is that the test for challenging clearly unfounded certificates, at least in theory, is relatively forgiving for claimants. That is obviously as it should be, because the right of appeal against decisions that may affect fundamental rights is of fundamental importance, and it should only be interfered with, if at all, in circumstances where the decision is obviously correct. So the courts, through years of case law, have recognised that, and it's reflected in three quite helpful principles, which are summarised on the slide. So the first thing to say is that although technically you are bringing a rationality challenge, in practice, it's a very different and more intensive form of review than that. The second point is that a key difference from an ordinary rationality challenge is that the case law establishes that the question of whether a claim is clearly unfounded is only capable of eliciting one rational response. The claim is either clearly unfounded or it isn't. And the result of that is that unlike, as, as you will all know, in most rationality challenges, it's not just a review of, of the reasonableness of the decision, the court will in effect decide for itself whether the claim is clearly unfounded. And the third point is that that's very helpful. <laughs> the test for challenging clearly unfounded certificates um, is, I say a high one on the slide, but really it's, it's a low one from a claimant's perspective. Um, in ZT Kosovo, uh, the citation of which is on the slide, it was held that a claim will not be clearly unfounded if it has a realistic prospect of success. But given the, the rights at stake, the case law can be taken really as, as establishing an even higher threshold than that, in that a claim should only be certified as clearly unfounded if it is clear beyond reasonable doubt that no first tier tribunal judge could allow the appeal. So that's obviously a very low bar that you have to meet, at least in theory. Um, and I personally find it quite helpful to conceptualise it almost as, as an inverse form of rationality. And what I mean by that is that, whereas usually you, you have to argue that no reasonable decision maker comes to the decision the Secretary of State has, here you're almost trying to argue that no reasonable decision maker, oh, sorry, any reasonable decision maker could allow the appeal. So this test um, provides another good reason to focus on the, the human rights claim and to spend whatever time you do have, which is likely to be limited, um, in making that as strong as possible. Because provided you can show that a first tier tribunal judge could allow the appeal, you should get an appeal right. And that would, of course, at the very least, delay matters, during which time you could be gathering more evidence specific to your claimant. And we can also hope that there will be more helpful generic material that comes to light. Um, so that's the test for challenging clearly unfounded certificates, which brings me to the third point. Which is the impact of the judgment in the Rwanda litigation on clearly unfounded challenges. The three points, I, I want to begin with what was unhelpful in the judgment. Um, and the key paragraphs here are 73 to 77. They set out the court's reasoning as to why, in the court's opinion, there is no general risk of Article 3 uh, ECHR breach due to conditions in Rwanda. That section actually deals with inadmissibility rather than human rights, but it's obviously relevant because a key plank of your human rights claim may be that there is a risk of Article 3 breach. The first thing to say here very briefly is that the court's reasoning on this passage is surprisingly brief. Um, it's, it's a very, very long judgment. I don't know if any or all of you have tried to read it all. It takes a long time, um, but surprisingly, there are a lot of parts, key parts that seem to have very little reasoning at all. Um, and this is one of those. So the court basically only deals directly with the question of uh, whether there would be a risk of harm to people who are political dissidents, who complain about the Rwandan regime and are suppressed as a result. It doesn't deal with questions of reception conditions, med medical treatment and, and other matters that were raised by claim. That being said, the court's finding ultimately was that there is no general risk of Article 3 breach in Rwanda. 
Um, and as can be seen by the final two sentences of paragraph 77, a central plank of that conclusion is the same thing that runs throughout the judgment, namely that even if there would otherwise have been a real risk of a breach of Article 3, there isn't because the arrangements between the UK and Rwanda are so comprehensive that no risk arises. So that's the unhelpful. Balanced against that is the, the somewhat more helpful finding or, or confirmation really from the court that decisions on certification must be made on a case by case basis. Um, so that's stated in terms in respect of admissibility at paragraph 84, but it's clear that the same applies to human rights decisions. And I say it's, it's clear, and an illustration of that is in AS's case at paragraphs 376 to 378 of the judgment, where you can see that the decision was quashed because the Secretary of State failed to consider uh, AS's son's witness statement, which went to his Article 8 claim, and the medical legal report, which went to the Article 3 claim. So what this means really is that the court has left open the possibility that notwithstanding the generic evidence, you may be able to argue that on the individual facts of your claimant's case, there are specific factors involved, vulnerabilities and so on, that mean there would be a right, a risk even of human rights breaches. That brings me to what I describe as the very big question mark in the judgment, which is that it doesn't really unfortunately provide any guidance at all as to how difficult challenges to clearly unfounded certificates will be in practice. So you can see from paragraph 373 of the judgment, or it's at least alluded to, that a large amount of our work and our submissions in AS's case at least were directed to the fact that whatever the court thought about the situation in Rwanda in general, there was at least a possibility that a human rights claim should succeed and therefore that removal couldn't go ahead and there should be an appeal right. Um, the court, for whatever reason, effectively dodged that. Um, they, they quashed the decision on more prosaic grounds relating to failure to consider relevant considerations and so on, which meant that they didn't have to decide whether there will be an appeal right. This effectively kicked that matter further down the road um, and it would have to be dealt with another time. But that's unfortunate because they did that in all of the, all of the cases um, that had challenges to clearly unbound certificates. There isn't really any clear guidance on how exactly they would approach uh, these challenges in the future. The final point or the final slide that I've got is key things to focus on to set up your challenge. Um, I don't actually know how long I've been speaking for, but Eva and Grace are going to speak on this in more detail, so I'll just do so very quickly. Um, I think it follows from what I've said already and what Mark said as well, that the key thing really is to focus on the individual facts that give rise to a risk of human rights breach. So almost to not necessarily accept the generic material, because certainly if you have different generic material, you can put it to the Secretary of State, there's nothing to stop you from doing so, but almost to implicitly accept that there may well be the case to say that generically there's no risk, but to say why your client is different. If you can do that, you should at least have a, a plausible challenge to the clearly unfounded certificate. And then I list in the first bullet points some matters that you might want to address uh, with your client to see if they apply. Again, Eva and Grace will talk about those in more detail. The only one that I want to mention specifically is that I think it's probably in future always worth exploring with your client for a witness statement, whether it is relevant to them that they be able to express themselves politically in Rwanda. Um, that wasn't actually something that arose on any of the facts of the case in, in AAA, but the court kind of alluded to the possibility, at least, that Rwanda is, is particularly repressive towards people who, who express dissent. And so it, it follows, although they didn't find that there would be a risk of Article 3 breach, it follows that if this is something relevant to your client, it, it may well be something that, that could get you home or at least get you a uh, right to appeal. So thank you for listening. Uh, I will now pass on to the next speaker. Thank, thank you very much. Well, this is going to be a brief tour through the way in which UNHCR's um, evidence um, uh, is, has been used in this case, and really just a reflection on um, how we uh, need to approach that sort of evidence. And, and perhaps the head note um, in all of this is that the focus on, on what UNHCR brings to the table has to be on the quality um, of what's uh, put in um, in its uh, evidence. Um, and then perhaps to focus also on in any individual cases we're bringing, um, where it's best deployed, whether it's in a judicial review or thereafter um, in a statutory appeal, because the nature of what UNHCR introduces um, and its utility may vary. So it's worth just thinking um, at the outset what UNHCR does. It seems fairly obvious and we all think we know it, but in a sense, 
It has a mandate, it has a statute, I and mean, its mandate is to protect under its statute um, uh, refugees um, specifically, but it also had been extended that mandate by the General Assembly of the UN to cover um, uh, stateless persons, asylum seekers and returnees. And, and that mandate works in lots of countries because UNHCR is determining who is a refugee itself under its statute. Um, and usually, um, and often that will end up with uh, people being set, resettled as refugees in other countries. It's advisory role in looking at how refugee status determination decisions work in countries which have their own status determination procedure, those countries which are state parties, is a sort of adjunct to that. And so um, it's capacity to have expertise on a particular matter. It's, and it, it, it asserts that it has, um, uh, it, special regard ought to be had both to its assessment of factual matters within its remit, as well as its interpretation and analysis of the protections and standards under the Refugee Convention. It comes from that idea that they are in fact um, on the ground in lots of places doing work to apply, uh, to determine who is a refugee under its statute, and also to protect more generally in a very practical sense, working with countries. And so when we come to look at the way in which the Divisional Court approaches that in this case, we can see that there seems to be a lack of awareness of that in the Divisional Court's role. They seem to think that UNHCR um, uh, is limited in what it can do. Um, and certainly the way in which the Divisional Court approaches UNHCR's evidence, as we'll see, um, uh, seems to really focus on the fact that they are just one among many witnesses of fact, if you like, thrown into the mix, when in fact UNHCR's whole function to protect um, in different countries gives it the sort of uh, a role in assessing primary facts and drawing uh, conclusions about protection risks from that, which uh, require almost the same, some kind of uh, consideration to be given to it, whether you regard it as special weight or, or, or consideration first before you look at other material. Um, it's something which deserves uh, consideration without necessarily just being one thing among many, as if it's a sort of superannuated US State Department report or some kind of amnesty report from very generic nature. Um, and so it's important to, we all understand UNHCR's role to interpret uh, the protection standards in the Refugee Convention. We've all used the handbook, various guidelines which are produced, but it's important just to recall just quite where UNHCR's expertise comes from. And you can see that obviously mentioned in the judgment of Lord Justice Sedley in the EM Eritrea case um, in terms of its uh, remit and also um, uh, that it sees itself under the terms of its own statute um, uh, as having a non-political character. It's not intervening in support um, of a particular cause or a scheme um, under its statute. It sees itself and its role as essentially humanitarian and entirely non-political. And so, um, and you can see there, um, uh, judgments from our courts in terms of how that uh, should be approached when it's interpreting the Refugee Convention. So not when it's giving a factual assessment of the situation on the ground, um, but you can see there on the question of interpretation, considerable way um, uh, should be given. In light of the obligation of member states um, under, under the Refugee Convention itself to facilitate the duty of supervising the application, of the provisions um, of the convention. So there's a role for UNHCR there, which essentially is uncontested. Um, and then you can see here how UNHCR approached its observations in this case, looking at all the arguments um, in the case that were taken um, and, and how its observations were made. And the focus um, there is really on, can you, not, can you transfer, not people who are determined as refugees for resettlement, but people who are asylum seekers um, to have their claims determined and therefore protection to be provided in a different country. So a very different sort of thing to what UNHCR is used to, which is, which is the idea of transferring people to a safe place for a durable solution once they're recognized as refugees. And so in looking at that, UNHCR looks at the convention um, and, set, and concludes that the requisite standards for an accessible, reliable, fair and efficient refugee status determination procedure um, are not in place. Um, and then, as we've already seen in outline in previous presentations, that there is uh, concerns because they were aware of specific instances of reform from Rwanda, um, concerned about the um, operation of the no deportation policy in practice, that there were defects in the system, defects in the system as they'd observed it, that are not addressed um, in the memorandum of understanding or in the notes of Baal. Um, and, and the position of UNHCR was that they only impose non-binding, unenforceable obligations, describe a system which would require profound changes and propose no concrete steps or timeframe. 
And so in, in a sense, what UNHCR is saying is, look, we've got the evidence and this is our view of what's going on. Um, you come along with your memorandum of understanding, your notes for a bar, and it's a sort of, it's a check on a semi-bankrupt estate, you know, and if you cash it, you won't get everything um, that you want. You're not going to get an effective system of protection. And it's not equivalent to our judgment or to our assessment. And then they go on to do things which are more traditionally, um, perhaps within their remit to look at whether or not what's going on, the transfer, of asylum seekers constitutes a penalty contrary to Article 31 of the Refugee Convention, which is something you might think was within their expertise. But if you do a, a sort of control F search of the judgment and go to the provisions and the discussion of Article 31 in the judgment, you won't find a consideration of UNHCR's position there. It seems to have been overlooked by the court, which focuses on their approach to the factual evidence, to the witness statements which they put in. Um, uh, and then to the detriment of UNHCR by not finding them um, to be of assistance in forming the uh, conclusions that the court um, had to make. So UNHCR's position was unequivocally there should be no transfers um, of asylum seekers from UK to Rwanda. Um, and then the court's response um, in looking at this um, was to look at the witness statements filed um, by UNHCR um, to note that they went beyond and were a little different from the information um, in its universal periodic review from 2020 um, in relation um, to Rwanda, um, and then to look at the way in which UNHCR's material was, was deployed by the claimants um, in, in the case. Um, and you can see there, and I won't go through each one um, individually, there are a number of points um, where um, they look at the detail um, of the asylum system in Rwanda, the Refugee Status Determination Committee, they were skeptical about the value of an onward appeal. Um, the lack of reasoned decisions was criticized. So again, looking at the process for a refugee status um, determination decision, and also, as we've already touched on, that there might be a protection gap in relation to um, uh, coverage of certain groups who might otherwise come within the scope um, of uh, having a refugee convention reason for requiring protection. And you can see there that, um, that the uh, opinion of UNHCR expressed through its witness um, was that, that Rwanda's asylum system lacked capacity and necessary expertise, um, and that was material in two ways. One, because asylum law itself is not properly understood um, in Rwanda, um, and then secondly, because the system itself wouldn't be able to cope with the volume um, of claims. Pitched against that, the court looks at um, uh, the differences, if you like, um, between what UNHCR was doing, having looked at Rwanda more intensively um, for the purposes of this uh, scheme for transferring asylum seekers, and what had been said um, uh, in uh, previous universal periodic reviews, which is not an entirely fair exercise, because of course, when you are concerned with a particular scheme and the way it's going to operate when you're transferring additional asylum seekers from a different continent um, to Rwanda, um, the question of drilling into the detail of how the system has been working in practice more recently and how it's anticipated to work under the Memorandum of Understanding and the Notes of Abal um, is, of course, a different exercise. And so it's not, it's not, you can compare apples with pears if you like, they're still fruit, but it's not going to take you very far in understanding one um, or the other. And so what the court said, though, was not to look at um, her UNHCR's detailed commentary based on its field work, if you like, um, in Rwanda, but to sort of weigh them in the scales with something of, an, of a different order entirely. That, that um, And to answer, if you like, a public law question, that the Home Secretary is entitled to rely on assurances, and this is the Offman point which Mark talked about earlier, in relation to the Memorandum of Understanding and the Notes of Verbal, um, on the basis that they're specific and detailed. I mean, to put it kindly, they're aspirational these things, the memorandum of understanding and the dates of that That's not the same to look at a forward idea of what you think you're going to do, to look at what is actually happening or what has happened. Um, uh, they're different sorts of things. And, and, and uh, but nonetheless, um, the question for the court, if you like, on judicial review is, um, uh, uh, what, what was the home, has the Home Secretary reached lawful conclusions um, in, if you like, in drawing up a scheme? Um, now, if this had been um, a, uh, sort of panel hearing in the immigration tribunal on the question of whether or not Rwanda was generally safe and if UNHCR evidence had been deployed as to the risks there. You might get an assessment of UNHCR's material with its expertise baked into those assessments of the factual matrix in, in Rwanda, um, which evaluated UNHCR's evidence, looked at the risk um, that it said there was, was both in the presence in terms of the risk of uh, onward reform, looked at the defects in the system and drilled into that. 
in a sense, the court ducks this in the judgment. They didn't do that. What they do is they do a sort of public law thing of saying, well, is the Home Secretary entitled to rely on the assurances in these circumstances? Um, and so when they draw attention to the matters which UNHCR was um, uh, relying upon, the agreement between Israel and Rwanda in 2013, um, and then the likelihood um, of Rwanda um, complying with uh, the Memorandum of Understanding with the UK um, and with the notes of a bar, um, exchange between the UK and Rwanda, um, they, they, they look at that and say, um, deprecate, if you like, UNHCR's approach because um, they say, well, you know, it's really a question of what the United Kingdom is entitled to rely upon. It's not a question, if you like, of whether or not what UNHCR says is true as such about what's gone on in the past. And, and, and that, that's a, perhaps an illustration, if, we, if you're being kind to the approach of the court, um, of what you get in judicial review in a public law context, as opposed to in a statutory appeal, um, where you're looking at facts and law. Um, but it's also a way of ducking the issue if you're trying to, to uh, or of not really engaging in detail with UNHCR's um, evidence. And you can see there the focus of the court's um, approach um, uh, is to reflect back on, on the cases of HF Iraq and, and AS Afghanistan and, and to say, look, when we go back and you look at the judgments of English courts or courts of England and Wales on um, uh, this question and you look at um, uh, how common law courts approach UNHCR, um, their evidence carries no special weight, just as a matter of, of classification, if you like, and um, is to be evaluated in the same manner um, uh, against the same principles as any other evidence. Well, it's a sort of fairly sort of open, bold statement of, of how you approach evidence of fact, so far so good, but, but actually there's more than that, isn't it? Because in a sense, UNHCR doesn't just come having a view, you know, um, it comes with a view based on field work, having a mandate, having a resource uh, where it's able to assess, gather evidence, assess it and deploy it. And so the question isn't so much do you start from assessing fact, different sorts of sources of evidence that are factual in nature um, to uh, before you go on. But the question is, having started from that base, what does UNHCR bring to the table? You have to go on from that um, in order to do it. Uh, it might just be that um, the courts find this sort of evidence quite difficult, because if you think about what UNHCR is doing, it's both the sort of guardian or custodian of the Refugee Convention in terms of explaining how it should be interpreted and applied, and then also doing field work as a matter of fact and what happens on the ground, in particular territorial jurisdictions, and then also judging the Rwanda scheme within the evidence which it gave um, in the proceedings. And then also occasionally jumping back and forth um, between all of those three things. And maybe one problem for the court in some senses is in, if you think about how courts sort of like to put little evidence into silos, is this witness a fact, is it expert evidence? So are they drawing inferences from things on the basis of expertise that they find it very difficult where to place that? I mean, that would be one way of being kind to the way that the court approaches it. But the other way to do it, to look at it, is that they don't really want this evidence at all as a source of expertise in the case. They simply want to judge, is the Secretary of State entitled to rely on the arrangements which is made with Rwanda. And insofar as that's not a question um, uh, for uh, that UNHCR can uh, advise on, because it's a question of whether you can rely on assurances between states that are of a non-legal uh, character, then UNHCR has no skin in the game as far as the divisional court are concerned in actually uh, reaching uh, views on that, which need to be taken into account. Um, if these cases individually or collectively end up in uh, determinations as to the overall safety and risk on return of Rwanda ever in the tribunal system, it may be that UNHCR's evidence can be deployed there um, to better effect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. You've got a question. Sorry, sorry. Just, just yeah, okay. on, on the back of what you said, yeah. um, and you're very much sort of pitching UNHCR as the custodian of the autonomous refugee convention, do you think the court's setting us up for a clash with that autonomous meaning? Do you, I, the government, that's, do you think that's where the government's going? I think it's interesting because, of course, it comes across after UNHCR's fight over the Nationality and Borders Act in terms of its view of what the correct provision, interpretation of the Refugee Convention was, which, of course, Parliament has derogated from in baking in its own UK interpretation of various Refugee Convention concepts. I do think there's a clash coming in the courts on this. I think it, it's... But, but it's the second battle. I think the first battle was last year on this. And it's all about degrading the effect of the Refugee Convention. And the UNHCR is the only 
if you like, supranational custodian of it, because the, as a sort of surveillance authority, because there isn't a court supervising the convention, is in the firing line as a result. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, Adrian. Our next speaker, I think, is Amanda Weston, Casey, also uh, leading counsel for AS. So um, as, uh, as Nani said, um, I had sort of custody of the of the AS case uh, during the summer. So um, I had uh, a, a particular interest in the disclosure process. And so I was particularly looking at um, what happened on the ground um, in AS's case as a means of illustrating um, uh, what had gone wrong with the procedure, what was unfair with the procedure. Interestingly, one of the advocates in one of the directions hearing described what the government was doing as backloading the process. And what they meant was nobody was gonna know anything about it until you were right in the middle of it. And that's exactly how it hit the claimant. So, um, uh, under the uh, MEDP process, the removal from the UK involved two decisions. First of all, this is the sort of the court's analysis. I have to say, one of the themes from um, what everyone's talking about is how, and particularly what Adrian just mentioned, is how the court deliberately siloed all the parts of the process in order to um, break down the extent to which you could rely on the generalized unfairness of the, of the whole of the process. So they sort of, they, they, they broke it down. And what I'm gonna try and do is two things. One, explain to you how the judgment does that and two, explain how you can get around it. So, um, uh, although um, in fairness, Isaac, he's already really done that, but anyway, we'll carry on. So, um, so, uh, so the two parts of the um, uh, uh, admissibility decision is firstly that the asylum claim is inadmissible, and then the decision to remove. But, uh, but of course, that completely misses out the initial decision, which is the referral into the MEDP, which happens before you get a notice of intention. So the first thing, the first decision that is actually made is. Um, are you um, suitable to be, for referral into the MEDP? And that's largely going to be determined by whether you've arrived in a small boat or not. Um, and then um, uh, you, you, you already had the law indicated to you and you've already had um, a clear indication given that the essence of the court's judgment on the use of the power to certify under uh, paragraph 17 and 18 of the um, is the individualized duty to make the decision. So quite a lot of the argument and the preparation of the cases was very much along the lines of, hey, isn't this a whitelist process by the back door? And doesn't the law not allow that? So, the, the, so that, was, that was quite a sort of um, uh, unattractive but compelling um, part of the argument before the court. And the court's way of sort of circumventing that whole thing is to say, hey, what was required by um, that certification process under part five of the act was individualized decision making. And you've heard um, from a couple of the speakers already what that consisted in. So you can see here that the Secretary of State's practice is to, is to treat separately issues arising under the Human Rights Convention and in ME, MEDP cases to certify human rights claims under paragraph 19C. And you've heard about that from, from Isaac. So effectively, the government treats the admissibility decision as basically a slam dunk based on um, uh, uh, their, to the general agreement with Rwanda um, and subject to the sort of exceptionality under the pre, I'm not dealing with the pre and post uh, June 22 situation because I want you to understand um, the impact of the judgment on the, on the process as applied um, under the order. So, um, uh, so, so the Secretary of State's practice is to basically hive off a lot of the individualised consideration to the human rights process. So, so your takeaway is make a human rights claim. You might be running in your human rights claim a lot of the things that you would be, would be relevant under the um, admissibility regime. But as Isaac explained, the only way you're going to get properly to litigate that is through the human rights process. So, um, so the human rights claim process, and that's because that's the only mechanism by which you get an in-country right to ability, as opposed to uh, being in judicial review territory. So query whether judicial review in territory in this, in, in this sense means um, really looking at uh, human rights um, 
uh, in substance because that's not an approach which this court um, um, illustrated that it had, that it adopted. So um, in this part of the presentation, we're gonna look at that procedure adopted by the Secretary of State in making the decision whether it meets the requirements of the statutory framework, that's to say the individualized nature of the process. And secondly, the common law um, uh, on, on uh, uh, procedural fairness, which we all know is completely contextual. So fairness is flexible context. Um, it depends on, it's, depending on the context, it depends. The, the, the ingredients of fairness, what's required by a procedure um, in any particular circumstance is going to be contingent on the uh, context in which it's applied. Okay, so just um, whizzing through uh, the, the, the process. So you've got arrival, screening interview, referral into the MEDP and detention, uh, issue of the notice of intention, and then seven day window to make representations. Now, one of the features which um, was apparent from the inadmissibility guidance given to decision makers was that there was very little flexibility. And it also transpired that there was um, stuff governing the, the decision to make the uh, MEDP referral, which wasn't in the inadmissibility guidance. And one of those things was, as Mark's referred to, um, the AAR policy. So basically, at the point of the screening interview, there was an assessment about whether they, you could be detained under the AAR, whether you fell into a category where you shouldn't be detained. And uh, that wasn't actually something which was, um, uh, uh, in, that, that the individuals were informed of. It was something that came out during the process of the, um, when we all got the GCID disclosure. So what we could see from that was that they've been the screening interview and then some officer had said, isn't this suitable for, because for MEDP because of mode of arrival? And then somebody would say yes, and then you'd be in casework, in detained casework. Um, uh, and uh, um, then um, th there was a question of, um, if you made a human rights claim, there would be a separate decision-making procedure. But by then, you'd always already be in detained casework waiting for your removal, subject to MEDP. So um, there were lots of uh, arguments about um, what the Secretary of State was required to do by way of procedural fairness, notification, two main limbs to that. One, what they told the individuals about what they needed to know in order to get themselves out of the process, what they disclosed about the nature of the decision-making process and the criteria they were taking into account. And the other factor related to the tame side duty, which is the duty of inquiry, and that is the, the, what the Secretary of State had to ask herself at the point of making those decisions and whether the procedure allowed the gathering of sufficient information to make the kind of individualized decision that the statutory framework demanded, not just in uh, the context of human, the human rights claim, any human rights claim that might be made, but importantly, because of the particular statutory um, uh, provisions that the government was relying on to um, uh, under, this is under uh, paragraph 17 and 18 of Schedule 5 of the 2004 Act, and we referred to it, but it was the individualized nature of that process, i.e. not whitelist by the back door, which meant that the Secretary of State had to have an adequate means of gathering all the information that was necessary in order to make a decision about admissibility. So um, uh, a paragraph 386 of the judgment caught um, uh, that reminded itself that, um, of the uh, uh, flexibility of the procedural fairness requirements, and then um, uh, identified what the Secretary of State's position was at the hearing, so that's at the AAS, uh, AAA hearing, in respect of the information that the Secretary of State was required to provide the claimant with, that's the first of the two limits we're talking about, in order for that person to make meaningful, effective representations on whether they should be taken out of the METP process. And so there you've got the four limbs that the Secretary of State initially indicated um, formed part of the Secretary of State's obligations to provide information to individuals. So far, so good. And then as a consequence, obviously, we all made submissions that, that, that hadn't happened. 
Um, uh, but then, in, in the, during the asylum aid um, part of the um, proceedings, which um, postdated the hearing we had, this is what the Secretary of State did. The Secretary of State resolved from the position and no longer accepted that fairness requires any opportunity to make representations about whether Rwanda is a safe country. So that was item three on that list. Yeah, that was quite odd. And there was a sort of, there was a, there was a sort of a ripple of um, uh, discontent amongst um, the persons in the court who, who had previously already put in their submissions on the other thresholds. And so and that necessitated a whole raft of further um, submissions. So um, this is what the court actually found. So the, this, this is the key stuff in respect to the admissibility decision, recalling that the, the court has siloed the, the procedural fairness arguments into the admissibility test only. So what they've said is that um, the Secretary of State has to enable the claimant to have an opportunity to explain why his asylum claim should not be treated as inadmissible. That is to say, why he had not claimed asylum in various EU member states passed through en route from the UK. So that very much harnessing um, uh, the uh, degree of uh, fairness or what was required by fairness to the content of the specific immigration rule, 345A-D, that the Secretary of State was relying on um, in the context of visibility. And then secondly, um, Fairness did not require the opportunity to make representations in response to the Home Secretary's evaluation or provisional evaluation of whether exceptional circumstances existed, which prevented an asylum claim being made. So that sort of basically ruled out um, all the information, all the detailed information about um, uh, uh, circumstances in which an individual wasn't um, uh, able to, to claim. So you were expected to um, to have made that um, uh, those representations up front. And then um, uh, secondly, that procedural fairness requires a claimant to have the opportunity to explain why in his case, his right to life and liberty would be threatened if he were removed to Rwanda. That's to say the individual circumstances, not the generic ones. So um, that as Mark has already indicated, left AS in a difficult situation because he had already claimed asylum in Greece and been granted asylum, notwithstanding that he had um, a lot of uh, information and evidence about the reason why he left Greece, which related to um, profound ill treatment and the fact that he wasn't able to uh, access family reunion. <clears throat> so, um, therefore, the court had concluded um, that fairness did not require the Home Secretary to provide each claimant with all the information she relied on to form her general opinion on Rwanda. That's the stuff setting out 345B. Fairness did not require that each claimant had the opportunity to make a presentation on those matters. Now, um, and, and the court also um, rejected, by the way, his case on the systemic unfairness um, of, of the process. Um, but that, it's important to, to note, relates purely to the admissibility procedure. The reason why those who succeeded did succeed was because um, uh, the court found that in the cases in which um, there was a, an account to give, um, and the, that evidence had been put in after the decisions about why um, uh, 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 asylum hadn't been claimed on route or details in respect of um, ill treatment on route relating to exceptional circumstances, um, but the Secretary of State hadn't taken any, any of it into account. So, um, uh, the claimant's complaints about the process, sort of generally summarised, um, I've sort of mentioned them briefly, that the timetable to refer the rule into the MEDP was too short to meet the individualised assessment required, that the, um, the lack of disclosure about conditions in Rwanda Certainly, I think it's fair to say that we all um, rolled with the punches during the process because what I mentioned about backloading the process is that nobody knew what was relied on. And indeed, um, a key part of the sort of puzzlement that we all have about the reasons why the um, uh, injunctions weren't granted is that we only really found out, including about what the FCO said about the, about the proposals, which um, there was some quite challenging evidence from the FCO. Um, uh, about the suitability of Rwanda for a, for a scheme of this kind. 
um, which, as um, Sonali pointed out, was uh, um, we had to fight through a PII hearing to get, um, uh, but nevertheless viewed through the prism of the court's um, view of the rationality of the Secretary of State's decision, uh, notwithstanding that material, the court was of the view that um, the Secretary of State was, was entitled to disagree with it effectively. Um, and then and, uh, the seven day period to make representations was too short. You've all been, I'm sure, uh, in a situation where you haven't been able to get satisfactory contact with your client in detention, or that your client hasn't been able to make contact with you or to secure representation, uh, and hence lack of access to lawyers. Uh, unlawful use of standard removal directions, five days. So um, that was a point particularly taken by um, a sign and made that I think relied on most claimants who'd faced removal directions because of course that necessitated the whole raft of um, injunction applications and recourse to Strasbourg. And then the screening interviews were inadequate, giving rise also to same side breaches, that's to say, failure to, to, to operate the scheme that captures sufficient material to answer the question that are posed by both the inadmissibility and the human rights process. So, um, as I said, the court focus on inadmissibility for the purposes of the procedural safeguards. And I think it fair to say that the, the court tacitly accepted that the Secretary of State's um, uh, fallback was that this it was all going to be sorted by um, a human rights claim. In the, but that doesn't necessarily, doesn't, obviously doesn't answer the question, but it also um, makes it of particular importance for um, human rights claims to, to be put in, even if they cover the same ground as a, as a admissibility decision. Um, and uh, um, I've just put the test there, but you, um, you already heard about what those, what those tests are. Points to remember. So, um, so the inadmissibility guidance was held by the court to be lawful in Gillick terms. That's to say it, didn't, it uh, could be applied lawfully. Um, uh, it, uh, it was sufficiently um, clear and lawful for decision makers to make the right decisions. Um, it doesn't provoke, but it didn't provide a comprehensive indication of factors material to the decision to refer to the MEDP. So for those reasons, learn from the uh, judgment and from the process. I mean, it's a little bit difficult to because the court didn't really go into sufficient detail on what emerged from the disclosure in the individual cases. Um, and so for instance, in AS's case, and this is, this is the sort of, um, I, I thought when I saw this, found this in the DCID, I thought this was a gotcha type moment because in AS's case, he had arrived, um, he was in a poor state. He was tearful in his screening interview. He'd explained that his son was there and um, it later transpired that although he'd been through Greece and through Europe, his treatment in Greece was so appalling that he um, it, it, that he was suffering profoundly as a consequence, and it's not a, you know it's not um, it's not entirely unknown. There's quite a lot of case law on uh, problems of treatment of refugees in Greece, um, and uh, and so um, it's something that um, uh, decision makers ought to have been alert to. But of course, he went straight into the MEDP. He didn't know that, that um, having a, a history of torture would have put him within AAR territory and possibly taken him out of the scheme because he didn't get any notification of that in his notice of intention. And then um, and there was nothing in the, in the admissibility guidance about that. But he, um, once he was in detention, he's, the, 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 so the detention rules kick in, he has a Rule 34 examination, he gets a Rule 35 report, that gets st sent straight and efficiently to the decision maker, but the decision maker says, I'm not going to do anything about releasing you um, pursuant to this torture uh, complaint because removal is proximate. So what that meant was he had no consideration according to the AAR thresholds about whether release was mandated by that um, uh, uh, torture report because he was in the MEDP and there had been a decision for him to remove, a notice of removal decision had been issued. So um, that's a very clear example of how uh, the way the process functions 
is to effectively circumvent the safeguards which are designed to prevent people from being entered into detention and obviously into un unsuitable schemes. Um, so um, uh, in, in these cases, in the cases that were litigated, in, um, as uh, uh, Isaac's already flagged up, the um, court dodged the issue of whether um, an individual who'd made a human rights claim in reliant on all this evidence and all these factors um, uh, would have been entitled to an in-country appeal on the, the um, tests that I expect you're all familiar with, having done lots of certification JRs over the years, and um, that, that uh, uh, Isaac has referred to, um, that they, they never got to test that, 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 and they never got to get that answer out of the court because the court dodged the issue by quashing the underlying decision as well. And the fact that the underlying decision was, was quashed meant that it was batted back to the Secretary of State instead of this claimant and other claimants having the benefit of the court determining whether or not um, it was open to a reasonable first tier tribunal judge to allow a human rights appeal against removal to Rwanda. So, um, however, in all the AAA cases, the human rights certificates were quashed, the underlying decisions were quashed, so the court got the issue. In some, and I think that might be that might be the end of my <laughs> in sum, um, what uh, what Isaac said. So in, 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 in some, um, the, the, the primacy and importance of making sure that your human rights claim cover all the territory um, uh, can't be overestimated, at least on the current situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're now going to, we might overrun by a few minutes, if that's okay. We're going to go to Ava Durr. She was also counsel for AS and appeared in the most recent um, hearing in September and also at the permission hearing. And she and then Grace Capel are going to talk about the practical implications of the judgment, i.e. what to do if you get a note of incident now, of which we understand there are many, um, and how, how to respond and what the interim position might be. If you want to put on the AC, that'd be great. Thank you. Strange when it's minus four outside. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you very much. I'll try to be really, really quick because I'm conscious of time and we're really keen to hear your questions and give you an opportunity um, to ask and for us to be able to answer. So I'm going to very briefly um, speak about the practical implications of this particular judgment and how as practitioners, you might want to deal with notices of intent um, or removal action going forward. Now, I'll briefly cover what's happening in practice while this litigation is ongoing. What you do when you are representing a person who's received a notice of intent, um, and then what issues you might want to cover um, in your response to the notice of intent. And in fact, a lot of this has been covered by my colleagues already, so that helps um, for me to hopefully be able to um, keep this very precise and quick. So my understanding is that there's still a lot of notices of intent um, being issued currently. Yeah, so um, this issue hasn't um, gone away, but um, is very much ongoing and individuals are then required to make representations in response to the notice of intent. Now, currently, um, no inadmissibility decisions are issued, is my understanding, and um, also no removal action is being taken. And one issue that um, constantly really comes up is the question whether we ought to be um, worried about removal action taking place while this <coughs> litigation is ongoing. So in my, um, or, or I'd say there is currently no, unfortunately, no legal barrier or general injunction that prevents the Secretary of State um, to take remover action. But it's really important um, to look at what's happened in the interim relief proceedings in the AAA claims. So one of the claimants um, in these test cases was granted a Rule 39 interim measure by the European Court of Human Rights, and um, that is still outstanding. There were in fact more of them granted, but that is the only one that still prevents um, that particular individual's removal. 
And um, in that, the court said um, that it would be ongoing until three weeks after the overall conclusion of the domestic proceedings um, in the United Kingdom. Now, the Secretary of State then argued on that um, very horrendous day on the 14th of June um, of last year, that actually that particular interim measure only applied to that very particular individual. So we had the pleasure of going to the Court of Appeal in the evening, um, who then granted um, interim relief to our claimants, um, essentially on the basis that the European Court of Human Rights gave such generic reasons that it was clear that they would have issued Rule 39 interim measures um, to all claimants who would have applied to the ECTHR. And on that basis, um, removal action was then stayed for all the individuals. So really what can be said is if the Secretary of State was to try and remove anyone, you'd have to apply for an injunction, but because it would likely be granted either by the domestic courts or if necessary by the ECTHR, then probably they're not going to try and remove anyone in the interim. And also there have been various political statements in particular, one from the government that suggested that um, they weren't planning any removal action until the end of the litigation. So hopefully for the time being, there won't be any further removals. Now, what do I do if I represent someone who's just received lots of intent? Um, what do I do? There are really four principal steps that I think are very important. So first of all, you need to seek disclosure of all of the relevant documentation that the Secretary of State holds. So that is, first of all, you know, things like interview records. Yeah, very important is a screening interview record. You can't really make representations without having had signs of the screening interview. But then um, you also want to ask um, for any other documents that the Secretary of State may hold, um, detention records, medical records, et cetera, et cetera. So that's very important. You also need to ASAP <laughs> respond to the notes of intent. Now again, and that's been flagged before, you only have seven days where your client is detained um, and 14 days if not detained. And therefore, it may well be important, um, first of all, to request an extension of time to respond to the notes of intent. Um, responses varied. Um, you might get a short extension. It's not gonna be very long, but it's just important to put on record that you're concerned about the short time frame, and then submit representations as soon as you are able to. Um, and of course, as well, another step that's important is if your client is detained, then apply for bail. Now, I think the best way of um, looking at how to respond to an office of intent is to really look at the different decision that you expect the Secretary of State to make in your particular case, and then to really frame the representations to address all of these issues or decisions that arise, or issues that arise in the context of these particular decisions. So two decisions that we've spoken about a lot um, this evening already is that obviously the first thing the Secretary of State has to do in all cases is to declare the asylum claim inadmissible. So you are going to have to look at the legal test and really drill into um, why um, on your individual facts, um, the asylum claim may not um, be deemed inadmissible. The second thing, and Amanda has really flagged it, you have to ensure that you make a human rights claim in your representations. So do flag that you're making a rep, um, human rights claim. And again, address the individual facts of your clients within um, the representations. Then you also want to look at other issues that might um, mean that your client shouldn't be subject to removal to Rwanda or consideration to be included in the MEDP really in the first place, um, I'd argue. But anyway, where a person says that they're a child, but they've been um, age assessed as an adult, you'll want to um, deal with that issue. You also have to look at whether there are any trafficking issues that arise 
and of course, um, any retention issues as well. Yeah, and really these um, decisions should be the target of your representations. Okay, I'm going to be very, very brief on this. Um, it's very important that you read the judgment in order to be able to tailor your representations. I know that's probably not what you want to hear because it's very, very long, but they're very, very helpful um, paragraphs that um, address individual issues that might arise in your cases. And some of them will help the Home Office, in which case you'll want to know about them, but some of them are also going to assist you yeah, for example, paragraph 213 might be of assistance, which is the consideration of the AAA claimant, I believe. And it's about subjective fears of an individual's subjective fears of being removed to Rwanda. So it's potentially helpful to you and um, you'll want to know about it. But then as well, what I think is really important when you read the entire judgment, there are very many issues that haven't actually yet been raised in these test claims. So you have a lot of issues that can be raised and will cover new ground. So for example, I'll just raise one of them, but I'm sure there are many. The possibility of um, family reunion in Rwanda is not something that has been assessed. So where you have family members, for example, in the home um, country, then there are issues about whether they can actually um, be reunited in Rwanda in the same way as they could in the United Kingdom. Um, my next two slides, I think, are very self-explanatory. So I leave you to read them yourself because they really just give you an idea of the types of um, questions you want to discuss with your clients and the types of issues you want to consider when drafting representations. And then again, of course, it's very important, um, and you'll all be aware of this, that in addition to making representations and um, yeah, to writing representations, it's really important that you ASAP think about documentation and evidence that you want to gather in order to bolster and support your client's um, case. Great. I will hand over to Rose. Thank you. And last but not at all least, and we're just going to run over by a couple of minutes uh, to introduce Grace Capel, who was also involved in advising some of the initial uh, applicants who were in the uh, original AAA cohort and um, on practical issues and uh, identifying the uh, victims of trafficking in modern play. But thank you, Grace. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to build on the previous presentation and highlight some additional practical pointers uh, relevant to cases. Uh, for potential victims of trafficking. So at the CMRH in AAA and others in August uh, 2022, the court stayed certain individual claims where the claimants were still within the NRM process. Uh, those claims were stayed until the conclusion of the NRM process in the individual cases, or if later, the conclusion of the main litigation. There are a number of other claims filed with the administrative court involving potential or recognized victims of trafficking. Some of those claims challenge the compatibility of the inadmissibility process with the Secretary of State's duties under Article 4, ECAT, as reflected in the Modern Slavery Act statutory guidance, as well as the fairness of the inadmissibility process for potential victims of trafficking. It's not yet clear uh, how or when the court intends uh, to deal with these claims. Um, and it's beyond the scope of the short time that I'll detain you further before canapes to discuss the substantive uh, legal arguments raised in those claims in like, light of the judgment. So, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about identification and referral. Um, unfortunately, the Home Office's failure to identify potential victims of trafficking persists in the, in the context of the inadmissibility process. And as we know, the inadmissibility process is one in which uh, things, allocation, screening, detention, notice of intent, happen very quickly after a person has arrived in the UK. 
Ideally, of course, you're going to be able to take detailed instructions before responding to the notice of intent. Um, but given that uh, most people entered into the process are detained and the short time frame for response to uh, the notice of intention, this may not always be possible. Um, so it's important to look at the documents you've asked for in disclosure to see whether or not tracking indicators have been missed. Firstly, the screening interview. Um, we know that the screening interview is not an effective tool for identifying victims of trafficking. Um, in many cases, a client will answer no to the trafficking question, um, for example, because they don't understand what trafficking is or what exploitation is. But there will be tra trafficking indicators raised in response to other questions. Um, for example, references to travel through Libya um, in response to questions about a person's journey to the UK, for example, which are not followed up on, or references to being in debt bondage, which are not followed up on. Um, indicators of trafficking have also been missed in initial screenings upon arrival into detention. These don't always uh, ask questions about um, trafficking or torture, but clients have on occasion volunteered information during that in initial screening. Uh, indicators of trafficking have also been missed during the Rule 34 Rule 35 process, which we you know, doesn't always operate as intended. Um, and uh, another place to look is the detention and, detention and engagement team induction interview, uh, which doesn't always happen promptly, but does include uh, questions specifically relating to trafficking and exploitation. Um, finally, if a referral has already been made, it's really important to ask for disclosure of the referral form, because uh, sometimes there is more than one incident of trafficking. Um, and we've come across referrals which have not captured all trafficking events, and that's been sometimes important in relation to addressing the inadmissibility criteria itself. Um, the next slide I'm going to do very quickly. So once the identification process has commenced or you've got a positive regional grounds decision, uh, think about asking that the person be removed from the process entirely, or in any event that um, the process be suspended pending the conclusion of the NRM uh, process and that any decisions made prior to referral in are reconsidered. So there are some overlapping or additional uh, considerations when responding to a notice of intent in a case involving a potential victim of trafficking. You may want to raise procedural fairness points, which are relevant specifically to the person's uh, status as a potential victim of trafficking, their failure, the home office's failure to identify the client as a particular as a potential victim of trafficking, or any delays in referral into the NRM. Also, potentially. Uh, Potentially relevant is the client's inability to provide instructions or a full account within the very short time frame for a response on account of numerous barriers to disclosure, which have already been highlighted in the Modern Slavery Act statutory guidance. And finally, and has already been canvassed, <laughs> outline the need for additional time to obtain critical evidence. Um, Tracking also may be directly relevant to the inadmissibility criteria. If a person has been trafficked from their home country to the UK, uh, unlikely that it would be reasonable to expect that them to have made an asylum claim in a country that they have passed through. Um, and one of the particular paragraphs of the decision, uh, which may be useful in relation to making arguments of that nature, paragraphs 308 to 309, in relation to the claim in ASK, where the court held that the Secretary of State had failed to explain her conclusion that his claim was inadmissible, primarily because she failed to deal with an argument that he had been under the control of an agent throughout his journey to the UK. But even if your potential victim of trafficking uh, was not under the control of traffickers uh, throughout their journey, consider if their experiences of, as a victim of trafficking are relevant to this issue in other ways. For example, that they have a subjective fear of being located by traffickers in a country that they have passed through. Um, what has the impact of their trafficking experience been on them? Uh, one impact can be fear of the authorities, which may affect their ability to make an asylum claim. And then also whether or not the um, experiences that they have been through uh, make them vulnerable to the physical or psychological control by agents, even if they've ex escaped their trafficking situation. And uh, a useful part of the judgment in that regard is paragraph 230, which I think they've already referred to um, relating to the claim in AAA. And the home, you can see in that paragraph that the Secretary of State accepted the possibility that there may be uh, there may be cases where psychological reasons existed preventing a person from claiming asylum in a particular country. And then on to safe third country and human rights representation. So I'm going to deal with it shortly. Uh, 
given the time. And um, I think the key point is obviously to ensure that the individual circumstances are drawn to the fore, given uh, the conclusions of AAA on the general safety of Rwanda um, and the court's approach to the MOU and the notes that bar. Paragraph 14 of the MOU is uh, the paragraph which deals specifically with uh, Rwanda uh, taking all necessary steps to ensure that the needs of victims of trafficking are accommodated, but provides no information about how this will be achieved. Uh, it's also worth noting that Home Office's information pack doesn't deal with the safety of Rwanda for victims of trafficking specifically, neither does the equality impact assessment. And the Home Office's CPIN doesn't paint a particularly rosy picture of their ability to uh, provide uh, assistance to victims of trafficking. Um, other evidence that you may want to look at include the UN Special Rapporteur's uh, legal analysis dated the 1st of June 2022, the usual US trafficking in persons reports, and um, obviously to be mindful of the probably rejected uh, uh, evidence relating to the Israel Rwanda agreement, which included uh, a significant number of cases in which people who were either trafficked out of Rwanda or were forced to leave Rwanda and then, then were re trafficked, for example, in Libya. Um, and move on. Um, so what about during the recovery and reflection period? Well, um, this is all, you know, obviously you need to do all standard stuff that you usually do. So making representations in support of a positive conclusive grounds decision in the usual way, which may include the submission of expert evidence, psychiatric reports, tracking reports. Um, you may also receive requests for information from the IECA. I've seen that in quite a lot of cases which involve, um, uh, which have been in the MEDP process, which raise credibility points uh, and including credibility points which touch on the issues of a person's journey to the UK. Um, but it's also going to be helpful to document or evidence what the impact is of the inadmissibility process on the potential victim's ability to actually recover during the recovery and reflection period. Uh, having, as they do, uh, as it were, you know, a sword above their head uh, and constantly aware of the possibility of uh, removal to, uh, to Rwanda. It's also helpful to document the impact of detention if the person remains in detention following the positive RG, although I would expect those cases to be extremely rare because in practice, potential victims with positive RGs are usually released on bail. Um, and whether, if in the community, the potential victim has been able to access support to meet their trafficking recovery needs via the MSVCC during the recovery and reflection period. So then my final issue that I want to talk about is the um, changes to the immigration rules, which are going to come into force on the 30th of January 2023, uh, which insert Appendix VTS, specifying the eligibility criteria for temporary permission to stay for victims of trafficking. Um, the criteria are set out on the slide, and you can, I mean, I would query whether or not they're as broad as uh, personal circumstances uh, in Article 14, one of the um, but the, the, the main point that I want to make is about uh, VTS 3.3. This says that permission to stay is not necessary if the Secretary of State con considers that the applicant's need for assistance with their physical or psychological recovery is capable of being met in a country uh, to which they may be removed in accordance with an agreement, i.e. Rwanda. Um, <laughs> So with, with that in mind, obviously, uh, we have to make our representations in support of a grant of temporary stay, uh, dealing with why the, the victim of trafficking's needs cannot be met in Rwanda, or why it wouldn't be uh, reasonable for them to seek compensation from Rwanda where that is an issue in the case. So again, drawing personal circumstances to the fore is going to be key. Relevant factors may include the impact of removal to Rwanda on an individual's mental health. For example, would it precipitate a significant deterioration in their mental health if they were removed, regardless of the availability of treatment in Rwanda? The impact of the victim's subjective fear of being sent to Rwanda on their ability or willingness to engage with treatment, again, if it's available. The effectiveness of non-specialist treatment for mental health conditions in the client's specific case, if the evidence shows that generalized therapy, for example, would be the only um, uh, treatment open to them in Rwanda by comparison to, for example, trauma-focused therapy or uh, EMDR. 
And finally, um, the consequences of the, of the victim's physical or psychological health are being removed from their support network in the UK, including uh, established therapeutic relationships that they may have established during the recovery and reflection period. Thank you very much. I'll just say, hey, Ryan, we've had q and A. Q &A I've been trying to answer as we go along, but there is one question which I want to ask Grace because it's the last question there, which is can, which I think is sort of partly indicated. Can we argue that a positive CG decision um, is compelling evidence for why the VAT should be removed from the inadmissibility process? Yes, I mean, there's also arguments that based on the uh, kind of, as it were, invisible criteria for entry into the process, that they shouldn't even be in there in the first place. But yeah, certainly the, you can also refer to the conclusive grounds. There was also a question about lack of interpreters in screening interviews failing to identify victims of trafficking. But again, uh, that's just something else that you may be in aware of. In the, uh, well, I think in the UK. Yeah. I believe that um, someone raised that there a lack of um, interpreters currently, which lead to victims of trafficking not being um, discovered at the very outset of the process. Yeah, I mean, that, that, does, that, that does sound like something which may um, result in a victim of trafficking not being able to uh, properly communicate during screening interview, why they should not be subjected to the inadmissibility process or a victim of trafficking. Okay, uh, so I guess presumably you that would also... <laughs> include the very strong argument that preventing somebody from having an opportunity to support the prosecution would be running counter to the whole of the objectives of the anti trafficking legislation. Certainly, there are there is a kind of um, there is a box of issues related to trafficking uh, related waiting to be explored for sure. Um, but yeah, sorry that I haven't been able to go into it too much. Yeah, sorry, we should try and pack a lot in. There is a lot in that judgment, as you all, as you all appreciate. Um, I'm not, unless anyone's got a burning question to ask, and I know we've kept you here longer than we said, so I, and also people online, of which there are still 150 or so, so I would like to draw this event to a conclusion. If anyone has any questions, they can email us, WhatsApp us, or ask us questions for those who happen to be here. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you to the people online. We will email the slides to you in a composite format. So, uh, and then watch the space for the Court of Appeal judgment. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>